Kathleen Gibson, and I'm a woman in long-term recovery. And once again, what that means is I have chosen not to use a drink or a drug since January 15, 1993. And I do share that a lot because I'm really, quite honestly, I'm, I'm, I, it's a moment of pride for myself that I made it to 30 years. That just seems like a really big number to me. The last couple of days, though, I've had an opportunity to meet a lot of folks with, with, with less clean time than that, less sober time, less time in recovery. And I tell you, it's really inspiring what happens here. Now, I'm going to ask if some of those doors are closed and if you quiet down. Clap once for me if you hear me. All right. So I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker. I know, lunch was exciting. One of the things that I want to share just a little bit about is as you're coming in, uh, you're wearing different colored t-shirts. It's been really an incredible year. The houses have given tremendously back to Oxford House. Voluntarily. When, when we first started asking the houses, you know, if you have it, can you send $50 up to handle some of the costs? Uh, I thought, we should make this mandatory. And Paul said, you never make anything mandatory you can't enforce and that most people will do things if you show them there's a good reason to do them. So I share that with you. And it's very exciting to see you all get to celebrate that later on this afternoon. Now, we're very lucky this afternoon to be joined by the director of the ONDCP, Dr. Raul Gupta. Dr. Gupta is the first medical doctor to serve as the director of National Drug Control Policy and lead the office of the National Drug P Control Policy, a component of the executive office of the president. Meeting is going on. Let's be respectful. OK, thank you. The ONDCP coordinates the nation's $43 billion drug budget and federal policies, including prevention, harm reduction, recovery support, and supply reduction. Through his work as a physician, a state and local leader and, ed and educator, and a senior leader of the national nonprofit organization, Dr. Gupta has dedicated his career to improving public health and public safety. His lifelong commitment to educating the next generation of physicians and policy makers has led him to hold academic appointments throughout his career, including as a clinical professor in the Department of Medicine, Georgetown University School of Medicine, and as a visiting faculty at Harvard University, T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Additionally, his passion for global health led him to join the March of Dimes as Chief Medical and Health Officer and Senior Vice President, where he provided strategic oversight for an organization's domestic global medical and public health efforts. Dr. Gupta is a national and global thought leader and a driver of innovative policy who practices what he preaches, and we appreciate that. With that, I'm going to ask you to welcome Dr. Gupta to the stage. How is everybody? All right, we've had lunch. Thank you, Kathleen, for the introduction, for your leadership. 30 years of sobriety, congratulations. And
and of course for your partnership as we work to build a recovery ready nation. I want to thank you all for being here today and what a wonderful way to launch our celebration of Recovery Month in September. I bring you greetings from President Biden and Vice President Harris. As you know, President Biden has proclaimed September as National Recovery Month. And I'm going to read you out what he said in his proclamation. He said, quote, millions of Americans know and love someone who is in recovery. We want everyone to know that they are never alone. As a nation, working together, we can make recovery real for more Americans, close quote. And you know, that's why it's so important for me to be here today, because your recovery helps make possible recovery for so many tens of thousands of Americans today. Every single day, this is important. And each of you are here today uh, is proof, not only that recovery is possible, but it transforms lives and it builds community. And right now, we need you more than ever before to help us. Now, you know we lost over 100,000 Americans last year, and I've done the math. That's an American being lost every five minutes around the clock. Now, these are family members. These are brothers and sisters, parents and grandparents and teachers and neighbors. They are missing at the dinner table. And we're in this situation because of the most dynamic drug supply environment. We know that what's changing is the way drugs are sold, the way drugs are bought, the way drugs are consumed, especially synthetics. We know meth is a problem. We also know trank is an issue. And it's complicating our efforts. It's cutting into a workforce, and that's where you come in. We also know that it's hitting our pocketbooks. And I want to share some numbers with you. This is what is important and what you're contributing to move this country forward. You know, we've lost in 2020, according to a report from Congress, $1.5 trillion of economy because of this epidemic, because of this crisis. That's a trillion with a T. That's the equivalent of the GDP of Russia. And this is why it's so important to make sure that we are preventing substance use before it begins. And when we can, we ensure that people get the access to life-saving drugs like Narcan or Naloxone, get treatment, and get recovery support services. Now, let me start by saying supporting the millions of Americans in recovery and helping more people begin their journey is a top priority for President Biden. As Kathleen mentioned, as I lead the $43 billion budget, we are looking to help support you in any way possible. And since day one, day one, I'm not kidding, day one, President Biden has been committed to bringing down overdoses, support recovery, and holding traffickers accountable for their actions. And he knows that we can't just focus on supply or just focus on demand. We got to do both because we cannot treat dead people. So this is a common sense for the president's policies it's two drivers, untreated addiction, and going after the drug trafficking profits, two sides of the same coin. And we're making historic investments in untreated addiction so more people can begin their recovery journeys and get the support they need for their recovery. Now, the President is calling for a 30% increase in prevention budget, 
And you all know this is the first administration to think about evidence-based harm reduction as part of the policy. Now, let me say it this way. I'll make it real simple. El Chapo's son is behind the bars, and naloxone or Narcan is going to be over the counter next week. In our new social media campaign, we're reaching more young people online and telling them the dangers of fentanyl and the importance of carrying Narcan with them. Now, we've also increased the amount of treatment providers from 129,000 to almost 2 million because we've removed extra barriers. Now, I always tell providers, you got 46 million Americans in America today that have a substance use disorder. These are your patients, so talk to them. And we've got to build a recovery-ready nation. Why? Because today, there's 27 million of you, 27 million people in recovery from a substance use disorder. You know that? And you here represent those people, the 27 million. Now, as a practicing doctor, I know that medical treatment is a critical part of achieving recovery for many people, but there's so much more than that, right? It is important to have a safe and supportive place to live, a community of recovering peers, just like you are providing in each of your houses across this country and across the world. These houses exist in the United States and across six countries because of you and your efforts and the efforts of Oxford House right here. And you know, recovery is more than treatment. It's about employment, especially when around half the country receives health care through the employer. It's about child care. It's about food security, it's education, it's economic opportunity, and so much more. And here's the kicker. When people get the support they need, they do amazing things, don't they? Just like each one of you right now today, and this is the value and this is the important. We should never, never, give up on people, on making a difference in their lives. Now, your work is critical to helping people build a life of recovery. So I'm glad, so glad that Oxford House is expanding its footprint, helping even more people achieve and sustain recovery. And in just two years, from 2020 to 2022, You've increased the number of Oxford houses by 12%. That's a big deal. There are now more than 3,400 houses across this nation for people who are on their recovery journey. You should be very proud of what you accomplish. Now, how can we as a country from federal government to each of you, better support recovery. And I've got a couple ideas about that that I want to share with you today. First, we can support recovery in the workplace. Everyone in this room, everybody knows that people in recovery are dedicated, motivated, and hardworking. They are a part of the backbone of this country's economy. I know this personally because I've got several people in recovery in my office working at the White House. And I, I hired them because they're some of the best employees we have. I also know that employment can be a critical to achieving and sustaining recovery. So we've launched a Recovery Ready Hub on the Department of Labor's website now, new tools that businesses can have 
to get people started, get businesses started. And here's what I tell employers. I tell employers, if you do this, if you do the right thing, a few things will happen. You're going to build a stronger culture and improve your bottom line, improve your business. You're going to know it's safe to reach out for help for your employees when they need it. And people in recovery will be able to create a recovery supportive environment in the workplace. And then you're going to start recruiting and attracting talent of people in recovery, which will build this country. And here's another way that we're working today. We can support recovery by making sure that people can have access they need to succeed, that includes people who are in custody, incarcerated. Now, let me tell you, I've been looking at the numbers. There's about 2 million Americans any given day that are incarcerated. And we know that a lot of people need that assistance of getting treatment, but that doesn't happen. And guess what? When people get back into the community, the likelihood that they're going to overdose and die is 120 times more, 120 times. So I think, and we estimate, that there's thousands of Americans today dying after the release because we don't provide care. And it doesn't have to be this way. So let me tell you a story about a, 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 a person I met, Freddie Flores. I was in Camden County Jail in New Jersey. He is 38, 38 years old. And he's been incarcerated off and on since he was 18 for 20 years for drug-related offenses. He'd been using Percocet for many years. But he wasn't diagnosed with addiction until he came into Camden County Jail in 21 January. They screened him for addiction right away. They got him treatment. And when I met him, he said, I'm not coming back. Because I've got two kids, sons ages 18 and 9, and I'm going to commit to them that I'm going to go out there and I'm not coming back and I'm looking for new opportunities. We need to help the Freddies of the world today to help this country. And that's exactly what I want to see in every criminal justice setting across America. And that is why the Federal Bureau of Prisons, with their 122 facilities, the federal system, is going to start offering treatment in custody. Now, people re-entering society need job training. They need housing and transportation and health care and food. And we have to work on these social determinants, starting within the criminal justice system. And to this end, federal government is putting our money where our mouth is. We're putting in, just yesterday, we announced $57 million at the White House to connect Americans to addiction and recovery services. Now, this money is going to help support treatment and recovery centers, peer recovery support services, treatment, recovery workforce, and so much more. And President Biden has called on Congress. He's calling for a $46 billion budget, $3 billion over the last year. And guess what? It includes a 10% block grant set aside for recovery support services as well. 10% of the money. Now, let me say this. You have friends. You have someone in the White House, in President Biden and Vice President Harris, who understands the recovery journey. And thanks to the efforts of this administration, the work you do in houses across America each and every day, we are making progress. 
We've, overdoses have flattened in 22. But we can't stop. We can't stop because every life lost is one too many. And we've got to keep pushing forward urgently to save lives, keep people alive, help as many families as possible. So I want to thank you for you dedicating your lives so that more people can follow your footsteps. And I want to know this. I want you to know this, that everyone at ONDCP is on your side. Now, we need your voice. Remember that. We need your voice. We need you to keep telling lawmakers and public health officials to support recovery. We need you to keep working to keep people sustain recovery, having the supports they need, including a home. We need you to welcome everyone on their recovery journey because we're stronger together, folks. We're stronger together. Because at the end of the day, this isn't a red state issue or a blue state issue. This is America's issue. And I know you're going to have a competition with the t-shirts and get pictures. But I can tell you still, working together, we can beat this, OK? <laughs> I will leave you with these words that President Biden often says, and I believe it deeply. Quote, we are the United States of America, and there is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we do it together. Close quote. Thank you. Let's hear it one more time for the director of the ONDCP. The green goes forward. All right, we're going to keep it moving. We got a lot on the agenda today. So I am going to introduce our next keynote speaker, the Honorable Kenneth M. Stoner is an Oklahoma district judge. <clears throat> that is not a joke, it's Judge Stoner. <clears throat> He's Oklahoma district judge for drug and DUI diversion courts. A Governor Fallon appointee has been both a county prosecutor and a criminal defense attorney since becoming an attorney in 2001. Kenneth Stoner is a skilled attorney who has a wealth of experience in law and criminal proceedings. His expertise and knowledge in working with those who have been charged with crimes related to, un to untreated mental illness and substance use disorder related offenses will help ensure they receive treatment and appropriate care. I give you the Honorable Judge Stoner. Thank you. Can y'all hear me okay? All right, I'm gonna come up here. I wanna kinda of keep it real, come up here with y'all. Uh, I notice uh, I got my Oklahomies here. All right, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, where, where's, my, where's my Texas people at? Whoa, Texas in the back, there we go. I'm wishing y'all a very, very successful football season, except for October the 7th, so. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I'm, I'm really, uh, I spoke here two years ago, had a blast. It was probably the highlight of my year. And I was so happy to be invited back. I just, I love being here. And I love being around all of this, uh, a lot of courageous people and uh, just being in the room with so much recovery. I've got a lot of really cool stuff I want to share with you. Uh, and I promise, I promise I will have you all out here uh, by dinner time. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, judge. Yep. Judge. Forty minutes. Forty minutes. Forty minutes. Oh. I mean, it's not. It's not usual. I got somebody to tell the judge how long they can speak. But okay. <laughs> um, I want. Whenever you give a talk, it's kind of. It, sometimes it's fun to uh, just start with some humor. And uh, I was given. Uh, by the way, by who, who was here? Uh, heard me speak like two years ago. Got a few people. Okay. <laughs> I, I told you all this story two years ago. I got to tell it again because it's kind of funny. Um, so I was giving a, a talk to this really important group of leaders in Oklahoma. It's called Leadership Oklahoma, and it was really important. So I was trying to impress upon them the importance of treatment and the, the importance of you know treating people compassionately in the criminal justice system. And I needed to nail this talk, and so I, I went to probably one of the smartest, funniest people that I know, my wife, and I said. Um, Barbara, will you please, I need, I need, I gotta say something funny. I need something really funny to say. And she's thought about it for a minute. She said, you know, honey, I'm, I'm, you really, you really should skip that. You're, you're not that funny. <laughs> and I said, well, hey, well, that, that's, that's not true at all. I said, people laugh at my jokes all the time. And she, and she said, oh, oh, bless your heart. You, you understand people just laugh because you're the judge. <laughs> and she said, just tell everybody your name is Judge Stoner. You're in charge of drug court. That's plenty funny. So. There you go. Um, anyway, the reason I'm here and the reason I wanted to speak um, is that I, back when I was 10 years old, I grew up in a home with addiction. And uh, I started going to Al-Anon, al and I think probably right around the ages of 10, 11, I learned to ask God to grant me serenity for the things that I could not change, to accept me correctly, to accept the things I could not change. And the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, these are principles. These are not words to me. These are not words to me. These are guiding principles that's helped me survive my life. And they say people that work in addiction, they're usually either affected or afflicted. One of the two. I'm definitely affected. I grew up in a home with a lot of addiction, and, and fortunately, I've, I've kind of dodged the bullet, um, despite probably having some genetics. But. Um, but in addition to that, kind of fast forward in my legal career, uh, I preside over our Oklahoma County treatment courts, and we are one of the largest treatment courts in the United States. Uh, Oklahoma County is probably 22nd uh, largest metropolitan area in the United States, and we're, there's 3,000 drug courts in the United States, and Oklahoma County is at the top 1% of size. Um, yeah, and, and, and by the way, who all here has ever been in a drug court? Treatment court? All right. Y'all are my people. I love you. <laughs> so y'all are, are my people. So for those of you that have been around treatment court, these are generally for people who, uh, this is going to get real here, uh, have usually failed probation usually multiple times, maybe been to prison once or twice back again, but they also have a moderate to severe substance use disorder. And it's either you got to get healthy, you got to get stable, you got to get sober, or you just got to go to prison. And um, and we have a pretty rigorous program, a lot of accountability, drug monitoring, treatment, um, and uh, 18 to 24 months, if you're successful there, you get to graduate, get your charges dismissed, at least that's the way it works in our county. Uh, I'm really happy to let you know that Oklahoma County is, is not only one of the largest, we're actually one of the most successful treatment courts in the United States. We have an 83% graduation rate. That means, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Over four to five people that come in, over four to five people come in and graduate uh, and get their charges dismissed and kind of go on to leave a life of, of flourishing recovery. And I, I, I really personally get a lot more credit than I deserve for this because a lot of our credit goes to our outstanding community partners that make this all work. And so one of our outstanding community partners in Oklahoma County is Oxford, you know? And so, uh, I know. We got this guy right here, Vic right here, Will over here. These guys have helped us place literally hundreds and hundreds of people uh, into a safe, stable, sober environment to help them launch, uh, la launch their way into treatment course. But I've, I've, I've personally had a front row seat and been eyeball to eyeball and watched over thousands of people get into recovery get out of really a severe, usually a moderate severe addiction into recovery. I've watched thousands of people be successful, and I've also watched hundreds of people that failed. 
Now, and so what I want to share with you today is just some of the things I picked up from that. I mean, so a lot of things that I learned about recovery, I have spent about a decade in the literature, in the books, and watching videos, and going to lectures, and reading the articles, and reading the publications, but I also have a lot of real world experience working with my people. Uh, and you guys teach me a lot about what works and what doesn't work, and I want to share that with you. So, um, the, uh, by the way, I didn't make up drug courts. Drug courts have been around for about 30 years. Uh, it's, uh, actually, uh, we follow a model that's based out of here in Washington, D.C., the National Drug Court Institute. I'm a member of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. I also have a program called Justice for Vets, which is vet, people with prior military service, like a drug court for veterans. Um, yeah, and we, uh, we also have, we don't have this in Oklahoma County, but we're working on, I'm, I'm a member of the Cherokee tribe. Um, we have a lot of native people in Oklahoma. And there, there's something about us native people that we, we do see the world as in our own ways, uh, kind of more traditional values. And so there's a, a model called tribal healing to wellness um, that uh, has a lot of very valuable principles embedded in it. So uh, anyway, I want to share with you three things today, fresh perspective on addiction, uh, maybe some insights on strengthening recovery, and also the power of stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, this is uh, Will Rogers. Will Rogers is, we call him Oklahoma's favorite son. Uh, if you don't know him, if you're not from Oklahoma, it's, it, you know, he, he's, he would be like the, the John Stewart of like the 1930s, okay, 1930s, 1940s, a lot of political wisdom. But anyway, one of the things that uh, he said was, uh, it ain't what you don't know that gets you, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Uh, and there's a lot of truth in that. What, what that means is that humans, we're kind of these weird creatures that we kind of tend to have some flaws in our thinking. We get really stubborn and closed-minded about certain things. We tend to oversimplify things. We take them things that are half-truths and we make them all the way true. Um, and so this to me is a really dangerous, and this is something that I think our leaders suffer from. They have a lot of opinions about you. They have a lot of opinions about addiction that just are not true. But I also want to convince you there's some things that you probably believe about yourself that may not be completely accurate. So um, I feel like this guy here <laughs> sometimes, when, as a drug court judge, sometimes whenever people come to the program, they're in addiction and they're so wrapped up in their addiction and they're trying to make this work and, and we'll say, hey, I got, I got some ideas for you. Why don't we try this? And you know what? I don't go up and put wheels on people's wagons for them. And the reason I don't is because I think the criminal justice system had it wrong for a long time. You can't force somebody in recovery. Drug treatment's not something you do to somebody. It's something you do with them. You do it with them. Right. Uh, and so we're there to help, we're there to help, we're offering tools and we're offering a better way. Um, and so uh, th th this, there's going to be a little bit of a, a theme that's going to come up here. But um, anyway, so let's talk about addiction, just trying to understand what addiction is. A lot of times people make it, they try to oversimplify it. And what I mean by that is like you meet some people that they know for sure about this stuff and they'll say, you know what the cause of alcoholism is? The cause of al alcoholism is alcohol. You know what causes heroin addiction is heroin. Like, well, actually, actually, it's a little more complicated than that. It's a little more layered. It's a little more complex. And if you don't believe me, this is ASAM, American Society of Addiction Medicine. It says addiction, this is, this is like the, the formal definition. It's a treatable, it's important, it's treatable, chronic medical diseases involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, environment, and individual's life experiences uh, prevention efforts and treatment approaches for addiction are generally successful as those for chronic diseases. But it's not one thing. If you notice, it's not one thing. It's, it involves brain circuits, it involves genetics, it involves the environment, it involves your life experiences. And so uh, that's a little complicated for me, so I like to simplify it with the three C's. The three C's are compulsive use, loss of control, continued use despite harm and cravings. And the one I really like to dial in there is that continued use despite harm. If you're still using and it's causing you harm, that's addiction. That is addiction. And um, generally the person who's experienced the harm is usually least able to see it. They're usually the least understand this is a cause of me the harm. Um, but, and, and one thing, especially if, if I'm working with somebody in, in DUI court, that's somebody's like, I don't have a problem. You know, the, the cops are my problem, really. I'm just bad luck, wrong place, wrong time. Like, well, because what, well, the, what they think is, 
Um, well, first, out, addiction is what they call a spectrum disorder. That means it's all along the spectrum, it's mild, moderate to severe. And so some people will be like, man, listen, I know what an alcoholic is. They got to drink all day to be okay. And I don't have to drink all day. I just kind of cut loose on the weekends. And it's like, well, because they're thinking severe, I'm thinking moderate. And it's like, well, no, it's all across the spectrum. So um, kind of mild harm still use, probably mild use, moderate harm. So you can almost kind of deal by the amount of harm you're experiencing by the level of addiction. But also people get confused about what it is. They get, they have misunderstandings of whenever, and some people think it's things like physical dependence. So, you know, I had these cravings or I had a, I, I felt I got dependent on a substance or may think it's, well, you know what this is, Judge. It's just pe people ain't got no willpower. If they just had some willpower, they could stop. Or you know what it is, I know what it is. It's just bad people doing bad stuff. Or some people say, you know what it is, it's a brain disease. Or maybe it's a disorder, I don't really know. But let's just talk about that for a minute because in, th these, are not the, these, are, these are what I call the half-truths. These are not the real, de this is not what's really going on. So when, we, when some people talk about addiction, they're confusing addiction with physical dependence and withdrawal. So physical dependence means that someone will build a tolerance to a substance and you gotta have more and more of the same substance to get the same effect. More and more of the substance to get the same effect. And so, and also when you take it away, you become dependent upon it and you start having cravings for it. Now, um, this is not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about addiction. This is something that would happen to anybody, anybody. Uh, you could put, if, if we could take everybody in here, we're gonna go replace your hip and you're gonna be in the hospital for three weeks and they put you on a morphine drip. Everybody in here after two weeks of being on a morphine drip, you would, you would develop a tolerance for it and you would also begin to have withdrawals when it took you off of it. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to like building a tolerance or using a, a substance as directed, so like uh, they say like about 85% of us use a, a, a opiate as directed. Those numbers might not be the same in here, okay? <laughs> just being honest. But, they, but just the general public, 85% of people, so the doctor gave you a morphine drip and said you can give yourself one, one, one drip an hour. Most people, 85% will give themselves like, they'll take it as directed. There's about 15% of us that will give us a little bit more than what we're supposed to. And then there's 3% of us that when they take it away from us, they will say, I got to go find that. And when they take it off of it, they just got to go find it. That 3%, the people that when they take it away, they got to go find it. That's the addiction I'm talking about. That's what, I, that's what I'm meaning by it. Now, some people think it's a lack of willpower. Now, these two gentlemen over here, you probably Churchill Bush, these are famous alcoholics. Uh, the, the gentleman on, the, on, the, uh, on your right there, the, they're famous stimulant users. Uh, most people don't know the story about JFK. If you ever want to understand JFK and the stimulant, it's, there's, it's a fascinating story. You can read about it. Uh, there's a lot of literature out there. Say whatever you want to about their politics. No one's ever accused these people of being low on willpower, okay? Um, it's not that. Is it a moral condition? Is it just bad people doing bad stuff? Most people know the guy there on the right, uh, Sigmund Freud, he's a father of uh, you know, our modern psychology. People know him because that cigar that he's holding in his hand. What people don't know about Sigmund Freud is that because he smoked those cigars, he developed cancer in his lips, in his mouth. Uh, he, and in order to try to kill the pain, he would use cocaine as a, as a local anesthetic in his mouth. He became addicted to cocaine, and then in an effort to get himself off of cocaine, he started using morphine, he got addicted to that, and Sigmund Freud died addicted to morphine. I don't know anybody who's ever called him a bad person. Most of you don't know this other person. Here's Dr. William Halstead. You have heard of John Hopkins University. He's one of the founders of John Hopkins University. And if you were a cancer surgeon, this guy is God to you. This guy is the father of modern cancer surgery. Uh, and he was also hopelessly addicted to cocaine. Uh, matter of fact, he lost his appointment at John Hopkins because he also got all of his colleagues addicted to cocaine. <laughs> And uh, I don't know what rounds would have been like with this guy at six o'clock in the morning with all of his colleagues going out high on cocaine. But what, whatever you want to say, these are not bad people. We get confused because people, you know, a lot of times like when, I, when I'm talking to my to the law enforcement people or county commissioners or, or leaders, and they say, no, these are just bad, they're, they're not bad people. Now, there are people that get addiction can do bad things, but they're not addicted because they're bad people. You've got that backwards. 
you know? So uh, it's that little half truth. Right. Uh, so it's not, it's not about physical dependence. It's not about lack of willpower. It's not about bad people doing bad stuff. So is it a brain disease or disorder? Well, interestingly, about 23 years ago, there was an article in the most pre prestigious uh, medical journal in the world that says, hey, we're looking at this addiction. We've been looking at it for a while. It looks like it might be a disease. It was his first time ever. They're like, man, this actually changes the structure of our brain. There's something going on here that we really don't fully understand. Um, and so it started there really about 20 years ago, we started thinking this, this really might be a disease. And then along comes this other guy. And you've heard other people say, it ain't no disease. Why are you calling it a disease? It ain't no disease. Matter of fact, uh, there's this really smart guy, Mark Lewis. He's a very famous neuroscientist. Uh, wrote a book called The Biology of Desire. And his whole point was addiction is not a disease. So what's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. People that say, well, it's not a disease. Therefore, you know, you can just choose to stop. These are those idiots, I'm sorry, that the other, you know how you have, you have people that were like read the headline, but don't read the article? Okay. These are academic nerds that are, are saying we shouldn't call it a disease because it's a little bit different than Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. We should call it a disorder. It's more of a disorder. It's not a disease, it's a disorder. We classify it as a disorder. And that's, it's, it's about how you classify stuff rather than there's not a single person that's legitimate in the addiction area that will uh, disagree with the fact that there's a lack of meaningful choice and the best course of treatment is compassionate treatment. We solve this problem with compassionate treatment and it's, there's not choice in the way that we think about choice, okay? So uh, here's America's favorite drug. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about this for a second. So if you look over here, this is the amount of, of alcohol that Americans drink, broken down by percentile. If you will notice the bottom three columns, there's about 10% of us that don't drink at all. They don't drink at all. And there's about 10% of us that, this is drinks per week, by the way, drinks per week. There's about another third of us that might have a little bit of alcohol, not too much. But then you start going up the ladder a little bit, there's about 10% of us that have about six drinks a week. There's 10% of us that have 15 drinks a week. And then there's 10% of us that have over 70 drinks a week. So this is where I ask the question, is alcohol addictive? Now before you answer, think about that in your head. Is alcohol addictive? It's actually a trick question because it certainly is for that top 10%, but there's actually people that use it responsibly. And so there are people that's addicted and there's some people that are not. So maybe that's not even the right question. I think we spend way too much time talking about the chemical hooks in the compound, the opioid, the alcohol. I think maybe a better question is what's different about that 10%? Is there, is there something, maybe the alcohol's not the problem, maybe the alcohol is a solution to the problem that 10% has. That, that 10%, there's something going on there. And that's like, that's not, the question is there's, there's something going on with that 10% that's different. That's why we need to be, we get, get away from talking about the alcohol, get away from talking about the opioid, the same, what's going on with those folks there? Um, so our Surgeon General of the United States did the first ever um, report on addiction recently, was it, it was several years ago, and by any measure, any way you want to count this, I believe this is the public health crisis of our time. COVID has kind of come and gone, hopefully, knock on wood, but uh, the, uh, if you look at what we're facing here in the United States, we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 66 million Americans that binge drink, that means four or more drinks at a time, this is on a monthly basis, and we have 27 million Americans that use illicit drugs or misuse their prescription drugs. That's 93 million Americans that, I'm not saying they're addicted, but they're flirting with addiction, they're flirting with it. So uh, what does that look like? 93 million Americans is every man, woman, and child from Georgia to Washington. Somebody asked me, why are you using red? Is it a political statement? No. It's not a political statement. I, just, I didn't even choose red. My, my legal assistant helped me make this. She just picked red, okay? So, um, so, but those are not people who are addicted. We have about 20 million Americans who would actually meet the clinical criteria for a substance use disorder. That would be the equivalent of every man, woman, and child from Louisiana to Idaho. 
every man, woman, and child in every state that's in red. So I show this to you because when I'm thinking about why I'm here and why you're here, it's because of this. Oxford has a unique opportunity to be so well positioned. America needs healing, it needs recovery, and, and such a foundational element of recovery is safe, stable ho so housing. And, yeah. It's everywhere. Um, this is our, our Surgeon General. He said, past approaches to these issues have been rooted in misconceptions and prejudice. Um, they've got to be addressed as com with compassion and as preventable, treatable medical conditions. What are the impediments to recovery? Uh, I'm a fan of the ancient Greeks, like those guys like you know, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. Uh, they had a belief that there was two sins that underlie every other sin. No matter what it was, you can always trace it back to two things. They said the two sins are hubris, means uh, self-importance, arrogance, excessive pride, and impatience. And if you think about it for a minute, everything you've ever got yourself into <laughs> that did not turn out well, you can usually trace it back to being impatient and overly self-important. Now, I show this slide because this is one I usually like to show because when I'm talking to leaders and they think that I'm talking about you, they're thinking about, well, that's right, judge those people in addiction, they're really self-important, what they've got is the most important thing, and their, their addiction comes first, their, their, their kids fall to the wayside, you know, all the other stuff that happens, I want what I want what I want. They don't have to delay gratification. I say, yeah, you know what, that's our problem too. Because as leaders, you're trying to desi design something that works, and all we want to say is, well, you just need to quit, you need to be better, you need to stop. Um, and they, they want to oversimplify it. And I'm like, you know what, the key, the key to this is on all sides, they're going to be humble and patient and let's work through this. Um, practice humility and patience. So um, our brains are these things that are kind of layered and complex. We have this very primitive part of our brain called the lizard brain. Our outer brain is what makes us uniquely human. Uh, there's a tug of war going on in every one of our brains. And this is really the, the heart of where addiction comes from, is this difference between what's going on in that area behind your forehead. The forehead is called your prefrontal cortex. That is the home of what they call executive function. That's kind of the thinking part of your brain. It's the part of your brain that helps you organize and calculate. And um, it's the home of morals and values. It's the home of impulse control. It's the home of understanding the future consequences of current behavior. It's also the part of the brain that doesn't work well when you're in addiction uh, because there's a tug of war going on between this prefrontal cortex and this kind of more primitive lizard part of your brain, specifically uh, this area called um, Nucus accumbens. Nucus accumbens is about the size of an almond. It's, in, it's, it's, a, it's a very valuable part of our brain. It's kept us alive. It's there to help us. Uh, but it's a part that controls a neurotransmitter called dopamine. You've heard of that before. It's the one associated with reward, memory, pleasure. Um, and whenever you, our ancient ancestors, when we'd be out and we would, I don't know, find food that, a fresh patch of berries uh, that would keep us alive, your brain would say, that was good. Remember where you got this. It gives you a shot of dopamine. Ah, this is good. Have sex, we've got to reproduce. Here's some dopamine. Remember how you do this. So it reinforces behavior it wants to reinforce by giving you dopamine. Now, there are certain substances that will hack that, <laughs> or mood altering substances. And uh, this dopamine is that neurotransmitter. And you know, there's all of us basically, we all have kind of a baseline dopamine. If you say that like, the average person just has 100, you know, about 100, we have some of us that are a little on the low side, we've got some of us kind of on the high side. Um, Y'all probably know people, I don't know, any Tiggers in here? Any Tiggers? Okay. <laughs> we, def we definitely have some Tiggers, I know, we got some Tiggers, I know. Uh, don't take this the wrong way, Tiggers kind of annoy me, actually. <laughs> I'm teasing, no, I love Tiggers, I say, but they're happy all the time, you know, they're just, they're just happy, they're just they're going great. Uh, you know, and it's like, but in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous, I'm jealous. They won the genetic lottery. I mean, they did, they just wake up and it's like, this is great, man. Um, but when you look at probably who's more likely to become addicted, you know, they say tr tiggers are more likely to maybe be impulsive and try a drug, but who might become addicted is more like an Eeyore. You know, whenever I have somebody in a treatment court, I might ask them, hey, when did you start using? They'll tell me when they started using, and why'd you use for it? Like, well, you know, 
when I used it, I figured out that I could finally fit in a little bit. I kind of felt normal in my own skin. I kind of felt like I had confidence. I could interact in the world. And I was like, you know, they wanted to feel normal. And like it was kind of a normal human aspiration to want to feel normal. We probably disagree with how they got there, but I mean, it's like you can understand how it happens. Um, when you talk about dopamine, this is uh, with the rat study. Uh, rats have, uh, they, if you were to measure certain substances in a rat brain, uh, somewhere around, uh, if your base level is around 100 and you have somebody that has food they like, your dopamine pops to like 150. When you have sex, it pops up to 200. I know. Somebody, somebody asked me once, like, well, what, what would happen if you were having your favorite food while you were having sex? Would that double it again? I have no idea. Uh, if somebody wants to do some research on that, let me know. Um, Okay. Cocaine pops your dopamine to 350. Opioids pops your dopamine to 500. Heroin pops your dopamine to 900. Crystal methamphetamine, 1100. And some people are like. And so I've shown this to people, and I'm like, you know, I know people that can't even stay on a diet a week. And they're talking about 150 points of a dopamine, and you're wondering, why do you lose your house, your car, your kids? Like, man, this is a powerful, powerful substance. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you something. So this, this is, I want you to watch this real quick. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. So when people, people tell me, so what, Judge, you talk, what you're trying to tell me, you're trying to tell me, that there's this little part of your brain called the nucleus accumbens, and it kind of turns people into zombies with this dopamine, and they, they, and they go try to help them go find drugs. It just takes over their thinking brain and they go find drugs. And I'm like, yeah, kind of, kind of. That's kind of what it is. I mean, it's maybe not exactly, but let's talk about what y'all just saw right there, okay? There's a different part of the brain. It sits right next to nucleus accumbens. It's called the amygdala. It controls fight, flight, or freeze. And what it's there to do is try to help you. What's it doing? Oh my God! Oh my God! No one would argue with that. Well, of course you would. So if you if you're in a virtual reality and you're being attacked, your body would try to defend itself. You know, you kind of go like this. There's nothing in his thinking brain that says, "Put your hands up. You're being attacked." There's a primitive part of your brain that overrides your thinking brain and puts you into a kind of a, a kind of a safety mode. It's your brain trying to protect you. This is a very similar. This is um, called amygdala. Amygdala is called fight, flight, or freeze. It's part of your autonomic nervous system, along with your nucleus accumbens. Uh, but as you probably can imagine, somebody that's being frightened because of virtual reality could probably be trained not to be frightened. It's like, hey, look, this is just light on a screen. You're not really being attacked. There's a ways to get through this. You can treat somebody out of this. So um, anyway, so what causes addiction? It's a combination of genetics. It's a combination of poor mental health. It's trauma. It's also early use. So, or a combination of those things. So I've never met anyone ever that had an addiction, meaning they, they end up using a substance, it was causing harm, they continue to use it by harm, that didn't have at least one of these three things or a combination of thereof. So sometimes it's a combination of people that are self-medicating some sort of mental illness, they started at an early age, they had a lot of trauma, they also had the genetics, it could be all of the above. Y'all know what ACEs are? Adverse childhood experiences. So whenever we were adolescents, you have a, a brain that was just forming, and you're talking about kids that had physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, domestic violence. Uh, look at the red right there. So if you had a lot of ACEs, you have what they call disrupted neurological development, which ultimately leads to adoption of high-risk behaviors, doing drugs. People are trying to soothe themselves. They don't quite feel comfortable in their skin. Uh, genetics play a huge role. Genetics do not cause addiction. They cause a susceptibility to addiction. Some people can drink and they can quit. And some people, when they drink, it spikes their dopamine higher and more quickly. That's what anchors addiction. And so whenever I can say, look, I can have a drink and I can stop, therefore you should be able to do the same thing. It's almost like saying, I'm not lactose intolerant. You shouldn't be lactose intolerant. I can eat peanuts. You should be able to eat peanuts, okay? Um, if you start using at an early age, this is really, really clear. Anybody uses at an early age, 40% of kids that start drinking at 15 will become addicts. If you wait till you're 21, it's 7%. What's going on there? What's going on there 
is that we've got a lot of what they call synaptic pruning. It means your brain's trimming off stuff it doesn't need. If you don't use it, you don't, you don't, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. So you have things like you know, impulse control. If you don't use it, you lose it. It, you can't grow it. You can grow it back, but if you ever, if you're ever in a situation, you don't know how to manage your own mood. If you don't, if you always self-medicate your bad moods, you lose the ability to do mood regulation. You can grow it back, but anyway, the more you use as an adolescent, you get this what they call millenniation, synaptic pruning. It really kind of hardwires the brain. This is a chart of what's going on in adolescent brain development. All those different curves there. You get into the green part. The green part is adolescent brains. You introduce a mood-altering substance to an adolescent brain, and all of a sudden you've kind of hardwired it for addiction. So what's going on with addiction? If you will look underneath, continue to use spite harm, you will always find at least one thing, if not a combination of them. This is what's called a Venn diagram. So look underneath addiction. You will always find underneath it trauma or mental illness or genetics or learn behavior that started at a very early age. People say, well, listen, I had trauma, I'm not an addict. Yeah, not everybody that, not everybody that has trauma becomes an addict, but everybody that has addiction has trauma underneath it. So I want you to look at this chart real carefully. Is anybody in that blue, does anybody you know choose to have mental illness? Anybody choose their genetics? Anybody choose to have trauma? Anybody, God help us, we start to punish people they started doing when they were 13 years old. Um, this is not something people choose to have. Um, so absence versus sobriety, a lot of times we talk about absent people like, well, I'm sober. Sober is the first step. Sober is not sobriety. So being sober is part of sobriety. Absence is just not using your favorite drug. Right. Um, thank you. Recovery is a voluntarily maintained lifestyle. It's something you choose because it's a better way to live. Uh, in, who's increasing your physical health, your emotional health, and creating a sense of a citizenship. Well, I tell you, we, we used to word, use the word spirituality, but the big shots here in Washington, D.C. said, ah, oh, we don't want to use the word spirituality. Uh, we want to call it spirit, uh, citizenship. But I don't think they understand. I don't think they understand, frankly. Uh, in the recovery community, I understand what spirituality is. And, and, and in, the, in the sense of recovery, there is an appreciation for that which is beyond and that which is between. This means something. We are all connected. We're part of something bigger. We are. And that's really understanding the meaning of that. That's part of what spirituality is. Citizenship kind of gets us close, I suppose. But anyway, uh, addiction is not one thing. It's a, it's a system. It's a systems issue. So um, like you know, it includes, so if you're thinking about, well, how do you get in recovery? Well, start working on safe, stable, sober housing, healthy relationships, physical health, employment, spiritual, you know, sober fun, meaning and purpose, healthy habits. So think about, um, whoa, how about that? <laughs> uh, let's talk about uh, strengthening your recovery. <laughs> First thing I want you to know is that your past does not have to equal your future. That's very clear. Um, I was thinking about, you might not have chose to get into addiction, but you do have the opportunity to learn that you have a chance to get out, okay? So, you know, I've met people who've been on meth for 20 years, heroin for 30, alcohol for 40, and you can change. Um, so, um, now I'm going to share something with you that sometimes there's things that seem like they're common sense on the, on the surface, but when you don't ever connect the dots, uh, it's, it's important, and, and people think, well, maybe, I'm about to show you something. To me, on the surface, it seems a little common sense, but if you don't completely understand it, um, did y'all know that we actually put a man on the moon before we put wheels on luggage? I'm being serious. 1969, we put a man on the moon, and we didn't have a luggage on our, we didn't have wheels on our luggage until 1972. Uh, and so I'm pointing this out because some of the things I'm about to tell you, like some of the stuff maybe is right in front of us, but we just don't see it. It's there. If you connect the dots and put them together, that's when the magic happens. <laughs> this, is, this is not an oversimplification, okay? Getting into recovery, you have, this is, we used to think there was a thing called mental health and physical health, and they were different. Now we understand they're very, very intertwined, okay? And I'm not saying you have to become a fitness fanatic. You do not have to become you know, like some kind of, you know, yoga monster. But I do want to say you do have to pay attention to your sleep. You got to get some movement. You need some nutrition. And I, I, I'm a big fan of meditation. We talk about this as a systems issue, physical health, sober fun, 
healthy habits. Let's talk about exercise. Uh, the benefits of exercise, you get more energy, better sleep, less stress, less depression, enhanced mood, improved memory, less anxiety, better sex life, uh, <laughs> higher uh, satisfaction, more creativity. Uh, this woman, Michelle Sanger, she, she runs again, this is like the best-selling fitness book from several years ago, and what she said kind of really threw me for a loop, because you always think about going and working out, it's like, well, you're always trying to get in shape. She said, do not work out to get in shape. She said, you need to figure out how to work out to have fun. She said, you need to figure out how do you, how do, you do some of physical movement to have fun. Fun comes first. Fun comes first, and if you can do it and focus on the immediate benefit, that's what you need to do. So when you think about this, why don't we think about this instead? Uh, sometimes we think about going to the gym, it's like, how about some of that? Instead of going in and thinking about grinding away on a, on a um, stationary bike, let's get outside and have some fun. And when you're thinking about exercise, this is me, so I do practice what I preach. A couple years ago, I did one of these crazy Spartan races with my friends. <laughs> so that's me there. Uh, and uh, have you all ever seen this guy, Wim Hof, the Iceman? So I did not want to do this Spartan race because I was afraid of cold water. So as I was afraid of cold water, like, well, I'm going to find this guy who set the world record for being in an ice bath. I went and trained with him for a week. Guess what? He had me in an ice bath by the end of the day. So... And this guy's crazy, man, by the way. If you want to look him up, he, he, says, he said, I will teach you how to get high on your own supply. And um, he, really, we have these endorphins in our body, adrenaline, endorphins. I mean, you can tap into that if you understand some of this, what he can do there. Sleep, your superpower. Uh, I'm going to teach you guys I wanna, one, one trick. Anybody here have trouble getting enough sleep? Yeah, it's a big, it's a big problem right now. I'm going to help you. This is a hack that works 100% of the time. It really, really does work. Go to bed. <laughs> We're staying up too late. Go to bed. Get off your screen. Just go to bed and you'll get more sleep. You'll feel better. You'll wake up great. You got to watch your diet a little bit. This guy, Jim Carrey, is like, I believe depression is legitimate, but if you don't exercise, eat nutritious food, get sunlight, get sleep consume positive materials, surround yourself with support, then you're just not giving yourself a fighting chance if you're not feeling good to get out and move, help yourself out. Um, I got to keep going here. Jackson's yelling at me over here to get off stage here. Hey, I saw this today. Y'all see this today in the news, CNN? Post Malone just lost 50 pounds. This, is, this, was, this was this morning on the news. This is on the news this morning on CNN, Post Malone, he lost 50 pounds. He's in a healthy lifestyle. He quit drinking sodas. He said, I'm having fun and I've never felt better in my life. Go figure. So I'm just not the only weird one, okay? Um, mood regulation, physical health. Uh, I'm a big believer in mindfulness, about a mindfulness practice. And I really don't, the word mindfulness, people get confused about it. They think it's some kind of like executive stress ball, stress reduction thing, and yes, that does work. But it's really about training your brain to be present in the moment and quit telling yourself these stories that are running on all the time. And also it's about emotional non-reactivity training, training your brain to be less emotionally reactive. It's a process. Um, and anybody of y'all have kids in here? You have kids? Yeah, a lot of kids, okay. So I'm telling you, if you do not transform your pain, it will get transmitted to those around you and even to the next generation. Do this for your kids. Learn how to slow down, pay attention. One of my favorite apps is this, um, and by the way, meditation, it does change your brain. It takes a while. It takes a while to do it, so you gotta stick with it. Uh, I use 10% uh, Happier as my favorite. I don't get paid for them. I'm not endorsing them. It is a paid app, but there's a lot of free material out there around this, but I'm encouraging you to kind of explore this. Um, so I gotta, I gotta wrap up here real quick, okay? Um, thank you. <laughs> In 1999, The Matrix was one of the highest grossing movies that year. It is currently listed on IMBD as a science fiction movie. I am protesting that. <laughs> this movie should not be science fiction, it's more of a documentary. We are all grow up in our own matrix. Culture and environment and our parents have been programming us for years. 
We grow up and you don't even know, you don't really even understand how much input that we get from the commercials and the television and what, what corporate America is trying to sell us and the indoctrination that we get that we listen to everything in popular culture. And so, and they're really, if you're the matrix, it's, a, it's, a, it's about the machines that are trying to harness the power, the, using humans as a power source because they got you trapped in this little bubble. And I'm saying this is more like a documentary than it is a science fiction fantasy. And I don't mean that literally, but I do think that a lot of us get into addiction, we get to where we are because of our programming that got us there, and the culture that got us there. I don't think, you, we do not choose to be in addiction, but you do have a choice to get out. Yes. Now, I, I used to just say it just like that, but you know what, I had to put one little word in there because it just sounds like it's just too easy. And it's like, you know, it's like, well, you do have a choice to get out. It's like, well, that's just, if it was really that easy, then I'd just, oh, I'll just choose to get out. And so I was like, well, no, there's, there's one word in there I want to add. I said, you know, you may not have a choice to jigs, but you have to learn you have a choice to get out. That's why we have meetings. That's why we have stories. That's why we share our own stories, because sometimes we repeat them over and over again. So someone's learning. You learn through repetition. And we're learning, oh, wow, I do have a choice to get out. I'm learning. I'm learning. And I'm sharing. It's what to be patient. And we have to be humble. we got to keep showing that wheel. Hey, man, this could be so much easier if you have these wheels on your, if you put these wheels on your wagon, man, this would be so much easier. But, you know, you can't run up and put somebody's wheels on them. you got to just keep showing them the wheel. You know, hey, this can work better. We've got to be patient with each other. Um, and you got to learn. You have a choice. So, um, Let's go through, let me kind of wrap up here, because I know I don't want to get in trouble with Jackson here. Um, yeah. Cour courage, by the way, courage is, like I said, this is not a word to me. Courage is like for real, for real. Uh, courage, people get confused about that. All this stuff is hard stuff that I'm talking about. Um, sometimes people think courage means being fearless, and that is not what it is. Courage means moving forward in the face of fear. It's being, I'm having fear. I am frightened. I have anxiety. But I know the right thing to do, and I'm going to do it anyway, and even though I'm afraid. That's what courage is. Now, right. And I don't want to make this oversimplified, but the way to get more courage, if you don't have it, you just got to hang out with courageous people. If you will hang out and expose yourself to stories of courage and be around courageous people, it will rub off on you. Uh, I say this in my drug court probably every day. I said, you have to have the courage to sit with discomfort while you're making changes, while the entire time your brain is whispering, this ain't going to work, we shouldn't have to be uncomfortable. Now, I put my name on here, but I'm also going to leave it open the fact that I may have stolen this from somebody else. I don't know. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm like, I read so much stuff, and then like, I'll, like, I'll start saying it, and I'll like, where did I get that from? Well, I think I made it up. Well, then I'm like, maybe I didn't. I don't know. <laughs> so well, when you read a bunch of stuff and materials, I, I can't figure out where that came from. So I think I might have made it up, but I don't know. I could have actually stole it in my subconscious. Um, anyway, one of the things that we're telling about our stress is this has freaked me out. Sometimes we tell ourselves that stress is bad. Turns out that what's bad is thinking that stress is bad. There's a new study out, it's a TED Talk, about it's this idea that that uh, they did a study of 8,000 people. You had 8,000 people that claimed to ha live in high stress environments. 43% of them had a greater chance of dying when people live in high stress. But the only people that died are the ones that believed that stress was harmful. <laughs> so you can actually, there's what's called a stress enhancing mindset. This is another story that we tell ourselves. Um, and uh, stress is your body trying to help you. And if you understand that, now I'm not saying it's comfortable, stress can still be uncomfortable, but it is your body's natural reaction to try to help you. It increases your focus, your decision making, your performance, and it turns out that stress is your body trying to help you. And if you understand that differently, instead of always trying to run away from stress, instead of embracing stress, it can help you. Um, all right, I want to I close with a story here, okay, because this is another story about how we, what we tell ourselves. This is a, a Zen story. Uh, back in ancient China, there was a, a family, and the family had a 16-year-old son. And for this, uh, for this young man's 16th birthday, they gave him a horse. Horses are very important in ancient China, right? It's how you transportation. And they said, um, everybody said, oh, this is so wonderful. You guys got a horse. This is great. And the uh, Zen master in the neighborhood says, well, you know, yeah, we'll, 
we'll see. And then the horse was kind of rowdy, it knocked down the fence and ran away and everyone says, oh no, oh no, this is, this is bad. And the Zen master says, oh, I don't know, we'll see. Well, horses are social creatures, and this, this horse ran away, and when it came back, it actually brought two other wild horses with it. So one horse turned into three horses, and everybody said, oh my gosh, this is so wonderful, this is great. And the Zen master says, well, we'll see. And the 16-year-old boy says, we've got to break one of these wild horses, they get on, and he tries to break one of the wild horses, and the horse threw him off, and he broke his leg. He broke his leg, and he had to be laid up, and he, he couldn't work for six months, he couldn't do anything for six months, and, but... During the first, after the first month of him breaking his leg, there was a war that broke out in the neighboring region and they came through town and they drafted all the young men of fighting age, but because he had a broken leg, he couldn't go. And all the young men from that village that went off and fought in the war, they all died. But he couldn't go because he had a broken leg. Now see what the Zen master says is that, well, it, sometimes there are things that look like curses that end up being blessings. There's some things that look like blessings that end up being curses. And I would never, ever wish addiction on anyone. I would not wish it on anyone. But, I, but, but some of the most amazing, beautiful, spiritually gifted people that I have ever met are people who have been on the other side of addiction. They are. Um, you know, it's like, you know, one of my, one of my buddies, he's been to prison three times, and I'm like, man, I, I hate you had experienced that, but man, you're a, you're a badass dude, man. I mean, you know? Um, so there, sometimes it is our struggles where you find your strength. You know, they say it's when you're cracked and broken, that's when the light can get in. You know, and, and part of my mindfulness practice, when my, one of my meditation, meditation teachers, a guy named Jack Kornfeld, and he says, um, there's a Tibetan prayer. And he said, may I have enough suffering, may I have enough suffering to open the, my deepest compassion for others and to open deep wisdom. So you have to have suffering to get the compassion and the wisdom to help others. And so on your journey of, through this, I won't ever wish addiction on anybody, but man, you, you can use all of your life experiences to be beautiful, spiritually gifted people. And I just um, wanna thank you so much for letting me talk to you guys. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Only seven minutes over, seven minutes over, so all right. Tell, tell Jackson that was worth it, okay? Thank you very much, Judge Stoner. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, you can do better than that. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jason and I'm a person in long-term recovery and what that means for me is that I haven't found it necessary to use a mind or mood altering chemical since November 29th of 2011. For that I'm truly grateful. So this is the part that I really get excited about because this is the part where we get to hear from individuals who want to represent you. They get to come up and they get to talk about themselves on a timed basis. And we're gonna implement the Paul Malloy timer. So we have uh, some spots that are gonna be opening up. We have three voting, re this is for the residents, three voting residents and two alternate resident. Then we have alumni spots. We have one voting resident, um, one voting alumni and one alternate alumni. So at this time, if I can get those individuals who are running for the resident spot to come up. That is Chad Green from Louisiana. Quitman Perry from Louisiana. Michael Wood from Louisiana. Matthew Trentley from Delaware. Brian Wilson from Colorado. 
Jay Williams from Oklahoma. Corbin Kirk from Virginia. Amy Alamon from Alabama. Now, I, I pronounce that the way we do in Louisiana, but I think that's probably wrong. No, that's correct. It is correct? Okay. Uh, Victor Knight from Indiana. Christian Hoy from Delaware. And Mark Bockles from South Carolina. Are you all up here? Anybody else still walking? All right, so we'll get started. Chad Green from Louisiana. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's good to be up here. I, I just want to ask uh, for a chance to play a small part um, in what Oxford has done for me. Um, you know, I came in four years ago, and it's been huge in my life. Um, I really think that iron sharpens iron. So, um, you know, the more service I do, uh, the sharper I become, and it, I'm slowly learning more and more. And um, I, I didn't really realize I was going to have to say anything. <laughs> But, um, you know, thank y'all. Keep it moving along. Now we have Quitman Perry from Louisiana. No, next. Okay. Michael Wood from Louisiana. Is he not up here? All right. Matthew Trentley from Delaware. Hello, hello. Um, so, yeah, I'm Matthew Trentley. I'm from Chapter 1, Delaware. Um, currently, <laughs> I'm currently the uh, Chapter Treasurer. I've held the pres or Chair position. Um, I've done quite a few of the positions at my house. Um, I really, I just did this because it was suggested to me, and same as chapter. Uh, so I jumped into it. I love it. You know, I do service. I help newcomers. And really, I just want to do this to try and dive more into it and learn and hopefully help you guys around the world. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you. Brian Wilson, Colorado. I apologize to those of you who were expecting a Beach Boys concert. That's unfortunately not going to happen. But <laughs> uh, what you are going to hear is a speech from someone who is dedicated to Oxford House and bettering Oxford House and making sure Oxford House can be the best it can be. I joined this organization honestly just a few months ago. Um, I was just out of rehab and I needed a little bit more. So I ended up getting myself into Oxford House. My first week there, we needed a new president. I said, I'm gonna do it. And then uh, we had some people shuffle in and out and so we needed a new comptroller. So I took that. And then I got to my first chapter meeting, we needed a new comptroller there. I took that. And then we got to, I got the chance to go to the state meeting. We needed a new comptroller again. I decided I'm taking it. And then I got the opportunity to come here. And I saw that we had the World Council available, and I had a new opportunity to improve Oxford House, not just in my state, but in the whole world. And I knew that I had to jump at it. And so that's why I'm here today, and that's why I'm here to be a candidate. Thank you very much. Jay Williams, Oklahoma. Hi, my name is Jay Williams, and um, I have a sobriety date of 7 6 of 2021. Thank you. 
Um, so I'm going to tell you guys, I, uh, just about a year ago, I was sitting in an orange jumpsuit in prison, and you know, I came straight out of prison um, into mental health court for Oklahoma County, and um, I needed a safe place to go. I needed structure in my life. I needed accountability, and you know, I, the scariest thing I did was walk up to an Oxford house and you know, I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, the guys in my house, you know, loved me till I, you know, could love myself and, and save my life, really. <laughs> and, you know, and my, my recovery journey started in Oxford House. And um, every day, you know, I'm just so surprised that, you know, I'm, I'm actually standing here before y'all on this stage because there was a time when I thought I wasn't going to make it and that, um, you know, my life would have ended with drugs. But um, ultimately, though, uh, I want to join the World Council and continue to be of service because you guys are my family. This is the organization I love, and um, I will do y'all proud. Thank you. Corbin Kirk from Virginia. How's everybody doing? All right, my name is Corbin Kirk, and <laughs> and uh, yeah, I am definitely an addict. Um, my clean date is August 3rd of 2018. I just celebrated five years. I moved into Oxford in September of 2018, and I, I didn't even know what Oxford was when I moved in, but I found out real quick because I moved into a sick house. Um, so, but with the help of some really good guys, we completely turned that house around, and today I like to think it's probably one of the more successful houses in Chapter 11. Um, I've been the member of two different chapters. I've been the chairperson of two different chapters. I've been a treasurer. I've even been the secretary. Um, I've held every house position several times. Um, I'm currently our state association's vice chair. <laughs> With that being said, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that I love service work. I, <laughs> I love being right in the middle of things, and I think that's where we get the most out of it. And you know, like I said, I've progressed up to the state level, and I think that for me, this the next logical thing is world, because what better way than to help everybody? I mean, because that's, at the end of the day, we're just one big family. You know, I understand we have chapters, states, uh, but we're still, we're just Oxford House. And that's it. Thank y'all. Thank you, Corbin. Amy Alamon from Alabama. How's everybody doing? Let's see. I'm a note person, so. My name's Amy. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama by way of Homa, Louisiana. Uh, my sobriety date is September 26 of 2021. And prior to that date, I had never tried to even go to an AA or an NA meeting or any kind of treatment. I thought if I could sweep everything over the rug, nobody would know what was going on in my life. I learned at an early age that childhood trauma and prescription medication go hand in hand. I just thought if I would numb everything that it would never bother me. I moved into Oxford House on December 28th of 2021. I've held every house position. I'm currently state chair for the state of Alabama. I've served as chapter three comptroller and chair. And I'm also HSC co-chair for chapters three and five. Oxford House started out with 13 men in one house. 
There's almost 2,600 of us today. Paul Malloy, it was said over and over again last year at the convention, his dream was 10,000 houses. We're not here because we've sat back and not done anything. We're here because we're leaders. And it's up to us to go back to our states, our chapters, our houses, and make that dream of 10,000 houses come true. There's a Kevin Gates lyric, and it's not two phones. It goes, I found my powers. You won't believe what I can do. And that's what I have found with Oxford House. I've found my voice, and I'm asking for you to vote for me to be yours. Thank you, Amy. Victor Knight from Indiana. Victor Knight, alcoholic. <clears throat> My sobriety date's October 19th, 2009, and I haven't had to take a mood-altering drug or drink since then. Um, I've been in my community, I've served my community for almost 14 years now, and uh, I came into Oxford House in February of last year. I've been there 19 months, and uh, I've been able to open a new house up for a men's house. Um, I've served my state, I think, pretty good. Now it's time to serve the nation pretty good. Um, I've helped my community out a lot, and I want to help y'all's community around the, uh, around the United States, and that's it. Christian Hay from Delaware. How we doing? All right, so I'm going to tell you about myself. My name's Christian from Delaware. My sobriety date's December 10th, 2020. Um, I'm currently Chapter 6's Chapter Chair. Um, I lived in Oxford House for a year and a half. Um, the reason I think I'd be great for World Council is, you know, I'm willing to be at service. And I don't know about y'all, but being at service helps my sobriety. Um, I've also, I've also held three um, house officer positions. I helped open an Oxford house in August of last year, and that was an honor to, you know, to open that house. You know, those guys in that house were phenomenal. Everybody in Oxford House, Inc. is phenomenal, from the outreach workers and all y'all. Um, I'm gonna end it with this. In honor of the NFL season coming up, go birds. Mark Buckle from South Carolina. Mark? Mark Baca, sorry. How y'all doing, everybody? Uh, my name is Mark Backus. Uh, I have seven months clean today. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I'm not a... I would rather be a more doer than a sayer, but I guess I'm up here to do my best to win. Um, I'm more of a challenging person. I have it in my DNA. Most of my uh, family are in leadership positions, and I guess if I had to come here to create my leadership, this is for me. Thank you. Amen. And lastly, for the resident position is Antonio Washington. Hey, when I say Oxford, you say house. Oxford. Oxford. That's right. Uh, first off, I just want to thank everybody here at Oxford House for bringing me here, and thanks to everybody that's running. Um, my journey has taken me to places, uh, many places, both good and bad. Uh, it's made me feel invincible at times. Uh, it's also left me feeling defeated. And uh, I was not going to, I felt like I wasn't going to make it another day. So for 20 years of my life, I thought that I was in control of my addiction, slowly realizing from about the age of 15 that, you know, my addiction had control of me. 
cost me multiple relationships, kids, uh, you know, having an absent father in life. So 14 months ago, uh, by the grace of my higher power, I made it to recovery. And after a six month stay at the Bridges of Hope, I moved to Chattanooga and got a, uh, got a job working in recovery. And that's where I first found Oxford House. Uh, my initial experience was pretty unsettling, to be honest. I didn't know what an unhealthy house was or a sick house was um, until I went to the state convention and learned that I was living in a sick house. So I brought uh, the information from the state convention and opportunities opened up and I became the president of that house and we turned that house around, man. And I think we have one of the best houses in Chattanooga right now. Uh, the people in that house, they, they are not only a part of chapter, um, but they hold positions and we're, we're really involved with it. So um, as far as it goes, my kids have a safe environment now to visit thanks to Oxford House. I got, uh, I got money in the bank now thanks to Oxford House, you know? And if elected, I plan to bring some high energy and some good times. So let's do it, man. Thank you very much. And this will be your selection uh, choice for the resident positions. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll call up those that are running for the alumni position. Positions, that's Melissa White from Tennessee. John Ben Edens from Kentucky. Cynthia Staten from North Carolina. Justin Allen from I can't read my own writing. Nebraska, thank you. Eric Perkins from Washington. And Seth Dewey from Kansas. And we'll start with Melissa White from Tennessee. Hey guys, I'm Melissa and I'm an addict. Hi. Um, I've been clean since December 2nd, 2020. Um, <laughs> I moved into an Oxford house at six months clean and I did every position that I could, all could be given. Anything, I was chapter chair, vice chair, every position in the house. I moved to a total of five houses to, um, to help out, to go where they were struggling. Um, I moved out of Oxford House back in September of last year, and at that time, I, me and a group of a couple other people started the Tim Tennessee Alumni Association, which we did not have. <laughs> Alumni Association, um, basically all we do is we meet up once a month and we help people coming out of jail and rehabs and we pay their deposits to help them move into treatments. So that's all I got. John Ben Edens from Kentucky. Good afternoon, family. My, my name's John, please call me Ben, and I'm an addict, a grateful recovering addict. So, woo -woo. All right, so my journey started with Oxford House back in 2016, and I moved in because I needed a cheap place to live, and then I went back out, right? So then back in 2021, I made a change and I moved back into an Oxford house after six months worth of treatment and I fell in and followed the model because I knew my life depended on it. Shortly after that, I took my first state position, which I stayed with for over 18 months. I started working within my state. I started helping with the different state associations. 
I assisted in opening our second association, which is our inner chapter to try to, to, try to bring more family and unity together. <laughs> whoop, whoop, yeah. What I really wanted was, is I wanted to build a family. I wanted everyone else to see the things that Oxford House had given me the opportunity to have that be a part of my life. The gifts and promises that came from my recovery and the things that came from being with Oxford House. After that, okay, I moved out last year right before we went to Seattle. And it really sat with me that what I wanted to do was expand on that. I have been on the state association. I have been in my house. I have done it within my chapter. And the best opportunity that I have now is that I want to continue that on a grander scale. And I want to be able to be a representative for each and every one of you. So. If I could have your vote, I would greatly appreciate that. Allow me the opportunity to please serve y'all. Thank you, that's all I have. Cynthia Stanton from North Carolina. Hello, uh, my name is Cynthia Stanton and um, I'm, Ooh, those lights are bright, child. I moved, <laughs> I moved into an Oxford house. My clean date is July 16, 2017. And I moved in to an Oxford house um, on July 28, 2017. And I stayed there for seven months. And I drank the Kool-Aid, right? So I was a house president. I, I have served on all... Um, I've been an a, a officer in every position in my house. Um, I've served on the chapter. I was the chapter chair from 2018 to 2019. Even after I left, I still wanted to be involved. I became an alumni. Um, I still am involved every single day in uh, expanding um, Oxford houses, learning new ways how to bring more people together and into recovery, and I'm just grateful for the opportunity. So it would be great if I could get your vote. Make it happen with Cynthia Statton. Also, I got one more. I, I, I got I got one more thing to say that um, I do work a 12-step program. I have a sponsor that has a sponsor that has a sponsor. Okay, so just know that too, okay? Thank y'all so much, I appreciate it. Justin Allen from Nebraska. Hello, my name is Justin and I'm an addict and an alcoholic and my clean date is January 14th of 2022. So when I walked out of treatment, all I knew at that time was that I was getting picked up by a guy I didn't know and being taken to something called Oxford. I was brought to the house and was introduced to everybody, shown a room, and as he walked away, he said, oh, by the way, if you don't have anywhere else to send your mail, you can change this your address. This is your home, too. That stuck with me. And then, Without me knowing the process for a meeting, I was voted in as secretary. I decided that I was going to learn as much as I could. I started asking questions. I just wanted to know the process. I read the manual, studied the traditions, realized it made sense, and kept going with it. I was eventually voted in as house president. I was also voted in as chapter secretary. And after that, I was voted in as state secretary. And I still hold that position. As chapter chair, I was part of the group of people in Lincoln, Nebraska that oversaw splitting the single chapter we had into two to better support all of the members and houses in Lincoln. And um, one of the things that I really like, um, in tradition one, says that we are here to provide beds for those that have stopped and want to stay stopped. I think that's powerful. I think that's what's the most important thing to me. And so I am up here to help and support everyone here and everyone back at home so that we can be there for the next person that has an interview next week that has stopped and wants to stay stopped and needs a home to do it.
And now we have Eric Perkins from the great state of Washington. My name is Eric Perkins. I'm a proud alumni of Washington State. My clean date, my clean date, 5:20 of 01. For those of you that can't do the math so good, that's 22 years and five months. I am proud to say I have spent 22 years and three months in constant Oxford House service. I started off in the house doing the things that you're supposed to do. My roommate tricked me one day, said we were gonna go to this thing, they had some free food. It was a chapter meeting, that was okay. A Couple months later he said, hey, I'm gonna go to this thing across the state, they got free food. I got in the car, it was a state meeting. Since that time, I have been over 115 state association meetings. I came into Oxford House lost, lonely, scared, and afraid. I didn't belong anywhere. I didn't belong with anyone. Through these things that I did in Oxford House, people loved me, they welcomed me, and they helped me. I soon discovered that I belonged to something that I was important, that I had a voice, and I discovered that I was a service junkie. I started out as HSC on my state association for two years. After that, I proudly did 10 years as a voting alumni on my state association, the second person to do so in my state. After that, they made me parliamentarian because I have been around longer than anybody. My mistake for getting in that car. I have been blessed to be the Camp Out Activities Chairperson. I am currently our state Camp Out Chairperson. And these things bring me an immense great of joy. These are gifts to me. Over the years, I realized that I had found a place, I had found a home, and I found something that filled that void inside of me, and that's Oxford House. For the last year, I have been blessed to serve on the World Council as an alumni alternate. I have done a lot of service work as I have spoke of. This last year has by far been the most rewarding, the most challenging, and the most fulfilling position that I have had in 22 years. We started a lot of things. We accomplished some historic things this year as a council. I am very proud to have been part of that process. We have some things left to do that I would like to see done. Please vote for me, I'm Eric P. And last but not least, we have Seth Dewey from Kansas. What's up everybody? My name is Seth Dewey, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. That means I ended my journey with uh, my chaotic uh, relationship with substances on July 23rd of 2017. And that started in Kansas with those people right back there. So, so can you feel the energy right here in this room? Every single one of you, that's, that's every one of us, right? because we're united in purpose when we're here, because every single one of us fights the same enemy, right? So do you want to keep this feeling going throughout the year? Yeah. All right. So that's something that Eric was just talking about, being able to keep that going. And that's what we need your help with on the World Council. And that's that subcommittee work. Um, so that's one of the things that we want to keep, uh, keep that going with, and we need your help with that. So uh, we started that. And, and we need you guys to, to be involved in that. And that's one of the things that we are trying to, uh, to keep going. So with that being said, um, 
we have a lot of work to do and we need your help with that. So we have individuals like Huggy over there and uh, Miss Lynn on the standards. And we've made a lot of progress, but as with anything in Oxford House, we don't do it alone, right? See, we can, we can get up here and we can talk about these great things, but we need you guys to be involved, right? So, um, so for, uh, <laughs> God dang it, guys. <laughs> so, so part of that though, so part of this, um, so part of this though, we, we wanna continue this work, not just with the subcommittee, we wanna make the work, uh, the, the work of the World Council more well known. It shouldn't be some secret society, right? And that's what we're trying to do. We've had more attendance at these World Council meetings that we've ever had, guys. Like the meeting last night, there were like 60 people there, right? There's individuals on these Zoom meetings. Marcus and I have been able to go to all of these, these conventions. Oklahoma, Arizona, Nebraska, and we're gonna go to more, right? We're gonna go to more. But for that to happen, like Eric said, we need your votes. So please elect uh, the ones that you see best fit to, uh, to continue this work. We love you guys. Thank you all very much for your consideration. These are your alumni individuals that you can vote for on the World Council. Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you all very much.